Welcome to Encana Drive Safe. We're here today with Dr. Louis Francescuti, an Albertan and world-renowned expert in the areas of injury control and safe driving. Welcome, Dr. Lou. Thank you very much. So I have a question right off the top. How does a professor at the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry become a world-renowned expert in the uh, subject of uh, safe driving? Well, when I first started training after medical school, I was in general surgery. And on my neurosurgical rotation, I remember very clearly going into the intensive care unit and seeing eight young guys, and they were all males, that were lying in beds with uh, serious brain injuries or spinal cord injuries. And I turned to the neurosurgeon, the attending staff man, and I said, what's going on? And he said, welcome to Alberta. This is what we see every summer. And that picture has uh, been reproduced over and over again, no matter what province or state you go to during the summer months. Uh, people are getting hurt at an alarming rate. And so when I looked into it further, I found that there was a great emphasis on treatment of trauma, but very little emphasis on its prevention. So after four years of surgery, I decided it would probably be best to try and prevent injuries than spend my, the rest of my career patching them up. So I changed from um, surgery to preventative medicine, emergency medicine, with a focus on trying to prevent injuries as opposed to just treating them. So can you give us some idea of the, of the numbers, the stats in both Alberta and North America? Well, when you take a look at injury deaths, both intentional and unintentional, under the age of 45, the leading cause of death is injury. And under the age of 35, the leading cause of death is motor vehicle related. So it could be motorcycle, it could be bicycle, it could be pedestrian, it could be motor vehicle. And uh, when you take a look at industry, for example, the leading cause of death in industry is transportation related as well. So the problem is driving has been made so safe and comfortable that we all think we know how to do it. And yet very few North Americans know how to drive properly. Are those injuries and deaths, are they preventable in your opinion? Yeah, they're all preventable. If you take a look at uh, injury related deaths, the motor vehicle collisions, for example, there's a matrix that we can apply to it called the Hayden's matrix, pre-event, post-event, and at the time of the event, and you look at the agent, the host, and the environment, both physical and social, and there's 12 boxes, and we can always identify why these events occur. So they're preventable, all yeah. these deaths and injuries we're talking about. Absolutely. Well, I imagine there's a number of causes that can come together to result in an injury or a preventable death. Yeah, and you don't have to be an expert. I mean, members of our audience probably can tell you exactly what's required to prevent these injuries from occurring, because they've got enough life experience. Even you know the 13, 14 year olds, as opposed to the 60 year olds, can tell you what needs to be done. So I understand there are a number of causes that can contribute to accidents or, or incidents and why don't we start with cell phones, I think everybody has one. Uh, I have to admit I am a person who believes that in stop and go traffic downtown with my hands free, I'm capable of operating a motor vehicle and a cell phone and, and I guess I'm not. Well, we'll, we'll start off with the, the choice of the word accident. The first thing we've got to remember is there is no such thing as an accident. So we won't call them accidents or we'll try not to call them accidents. Uh, but the most dangerous thing that people do right now is use these gadgets while they're driving. There's about 160 studies that tell us that you cannot talk on a cell phone, whether it's hands held or hands free, and drive at the same time. Doing so is the equivalent to driving impaired. And it's not just the talking, but it's the text messaging, it's uh, looking up the weather report, it's checking your shopping list, it's all the things that we do that are the distractors. What we're finding is that people that continue to do this are four to six times more likely to be involved in collisions. Their reaction time is reduced by about 20%. They're more likely to be involved in rear-end collisions. They're more likely to be involved in left-hand turn collisions. So uh, when you go home tonight and you pick up that phone as you're driving, you've got to remember that by doing that, you're going to increase the likelihood that you're going to be involved in a collision by four to six times. And you can't cheat because if the phone's in the car and it rings, you've been programmed since a baby that if it rings, you answer it. And if you're not going to answer it, at least you're going to look at call display to find out who it is. 
All right. Well, isn't that interesting? I bet I'm not alone in thinking that I'm, I'm somehow capable. I mean, these are very sobering stats, but we sort of have this um, programming that somehow we can do it. We can do all these things while we drive. Well, we think we can. And when we're driving and we see someone that's driving erratically, that uh, they look like they're driving impaired, and then you actually pull up beside them, and what they're doing is they're talking on their cell phone. Um, I can't be the only one who is uh, transgressing the law of cell phone use and uh, driving a motor vehicle. I'd really like to hear if anybody in the audience has any comments or questions about that. Dr. Liu, I was wondering if you could explain the difference between uh, using a hands-free or talking with another passenger that's in the vehicle with you and how your risk might be increased in that way. Well, that, that's a good question. Uh, there is a big difference between the conversation you have with a passenger as opposed to someone that you can't see. Because the passenger and you will adjust the conversation depending on the speed, the density of the traffic, how many vehicles there are, the kinds of maneuvers you're doing if you're on a very busy highway, and uh, a lot of host of circumstances around that particular situation. As opposed to if you take a call from your teenage son who's just been involved in an injury, or has just won a big award, or your boss is calling you because he's not happy with your performance, then you're focusing on the conversation. And that takes a lot of cognitive ability. Conversing with someone is very complicated. Conversing with someone that you don't see is very, very complicated. And so that's why the studies show us it makes no difference whether it's hands-held or hands-free. It's the conversation that's the distractor. And the conversation with a passenger is very different than a conversation with someone that you don't see. Good question. Uh, anyone else? Comments or questions about uh, driving and cell phone use? So, Dr. Liu, what do you say to the people that get lots of work done on the way home or the way to work talking on their cell phone, as I'm sure we all do, or say for a lot of Encana field employees, they're probably getting lots of work done driving to location and from location? Well, there's a good study that just came out uh, last year, Amec, a big engineering firm worldwide, banned the use of cell phones within their organization. And a year later came back and asked their employees, did it have any impact on your productivity? And n over 95% of the AMEC employees came back and said no. It had absolutely no impact. As a matter of fact, it made me a better employee because I'm less stressful, I plan my work better, and if I am taking those long trips, what I do now is I stop every hour to take a break, like they're supposed to, and catch up on my messages at the same time. I just had a quick comment. Um, I think it's really interesting that you relate cell phone, talking to your cell phone while driving to being impaired because I would never think of drinking and driving and I would never get in my car and not put my seatbelt on, but I check my email, I talk on the phone, I'm a text messenger, and um, I've actually been driving and had incidents where I can't remember the last 20 or 30 seconds of the ride. So. Yeah, and uh, the thing you've got to remember as well is there's some people that are driving from point A to point B and they get to point B and they don't remember anything about the trip whatsoever. And so uh, it's an addiction that we have to break and unfortunately uh, it's a powerful addiction. Dr. Liu, I have a question about some of our operational realities. Up in the north we have a lot of one-way, uh, two-way radio controlled roads and I'm trying to find a way to, you know, think of a way that's safer for that to happen because really the safety of those drivers depends on them calling their kilometers. Yeah, and that's not a problem. And the reason that's not a problem is because exactly what you said, uh, those roads are controlled by calling in, but when you're calling in, it takes maybe one second, kilometer 42. That's not a conversation. So there's absolutely no study that shows that that's a distractor. As a matter of fact, I would probably be concerned if people weren't calling in their kilometers. I know I find when I'm driving, I'm very distracted when a passenger is on the cell phone. What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's the whole environment within the vehicle. And uh, for young people, I think that sometimes they forget they're driving. The driver of a vehicle where there's a whole bunch of young people is really the host of a party. And the best example I can give you is I gave a talk at one of the local colleges and a young female came up afterwards and said, you know, Doc, you're absolutely right. I was 16, I just got my license, mom lent me the van, I was so excited, we were all driving, it was my boyfriend's birthday and I was so happy that it was the first month we were going out together and I was text messaging him how much I loved him and the happy birthday and she said I plowed into the car in front of me. And I said, well, that's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. It's dangerous. She goes, no, Doc, it gets worse. And I said, well, how can it get any worse? 
She says, well, I was text messaging him. He was in the back seat. So that's the kind of stuff that's going on in these vehicles, is that they're sort of kind of party environments. And people are talking to each other on cell phones within the vehicle because it's so loud and they're text messaging, and nobody's concentrating on the driving. So quite frankly, I'm surprised that we're not killing ourselves at a greater rate given all the distractions that are in the vehicle today. But the cell phone is the one that you can actually control by putting down and leaving it alone. You get in the vehicle, the cell phone is off, until you get out of the vehicle. This is Encana Drive Safe, and Encana, like most corporations, has an alcohol and drug policy. In this section, we're going to talk about substance abuse, and I'm wondering, let's, what are we talking about when we talk about substance abuse? It's not just alcohol and drugs. No, it's a very broad topic, and uh, the most common ones are drinking. Uh, the second one is various drugs, but drugs can be broken down into two big categories. There's the illicit drugs, and then there's prescription drugs as well, and they both contribute to the problem as well. So what happens to the body when, and I, I mean it seems, I think we'd all think we know what happens to the body, but what happens you know, when you're taking alcohol and drugs and operating a motor vehicle? Well, your ability to react is the big one. So your ability to react is decreased in, in all spheres. Uh, we know when we put people in driving simulators, for example, and we just put them through a series of exercises, people will make a certain amount of errors uh, when they're drug free. But then when we put them in the simulators and we give them various amounts of alcohol or drugs and test their ability to react, we see a sharp rise in the number of mistakes that they're going to make as well. And, and the trouble is though that within society, at least North American society, it's still viewed as being culturally okay to drink and drive. We've really pushed the message to our young generation and they seem to be making some great strides, but it's still the middle age and the senior population that has a problem getting the message. So drinking and driving is a major problem. We know that after 11 o'clock at night, it's estimated that 30% of all drivers on the road are driving legally impaired. And uh, so that doesn't give most of us a lot of comfort if we're driving at night knowing that you know, three out of 10 cars that's passing you is uh, being driven by someone that's impaired. So as a society, we have to really wake up to the fact that uh, this is one of the major contributors to motor vehicle fatalities. Uh, when we measure the blood alcohol levels and when we measure drug levels in people that actually get killed in car crashes, uh, the numbers are quite high, alarmingly high actually. I, I thought it was interesting you talked about non-prescription drugs. So that could be, what would be an example of that that, that could impair your ability to well, drive? Well, the, the antihistamines that people take, you know, for allergies or the uh, medication as simple as gravel, you know, for upset stomachs that has that sort of drowsy kind of effect. Um, those are things that uh, are very common over-the-counter medications that uh, can make people sleepy. The other ones are the prescribed medications as well. Uh, Dr. Liu, you briefly talked about uh, the effects that alcohol has on the impairment factor of your physiological, your body makeup. What about the judgment factor as far as even getting in the vehicle and driving in the first place? Well, you know, every drunk thinks that they're a great driver. I mean, that's the, the story that you see all the time at parties where people that are drinking and that are intoxicated will want to drive because their inhibition has been lowered their perception of reality has been lowered and their confidence has been boosted up quite significantly. And uh, we know that in Alberta, for example, you can drive legally impaired, it's estimated about 2,000 times before you'll be stopped and charged with impaired driving. Dr. Liu, I know a lot of people who are responsible when they go out drinking, but I also know that those people who are responsible going home from the bar are the same people who are getting up three and four hours later to get in their car to drive to work. How do we discourage people from doing that? Well, we have to make them aware that when they're getting up in the morning, that if we were to test them for alcohol, for example, we would still find alcohol in them at the level that you can get a 24-hour suspension probably. Most people don't realize that.
right, so let's talk a little bit about speeding. It's, the signs are clearly posted, yet people continue to do it. How is speeding related to uh, injury or motor vehicle accidents or incidents? Well, speeding never killed anyone. It's the sudden stop that kills. Because people think that speeding, well, they're all safe speeders. When, you know, the majority of people are surveyed, they all tell you that, well, yeah, they speed, but they're safe speeders. They're safer than the other speeder. But people have to realize that for every extra mile an hour or kilometer an hour you're traveling, you're really increasing your risk of injury in the event of a collision. And so we know that if you can reduce a concept known as free speed, free speed within a community would be sort of the combined speed on all the roads in a community. If you can reduce the free speed by 1%, you can reduce fatalities by 5%. So in theory, if you wanted to eliminate all fatalities on the roadway, you would still have injuries, but you could eliminate all fatalities on the roadway by reducing speed by 20%. So, and that's of course a dual um, challenge because I think everybody at some point in their working life has felt like I'm late and it won't matter if I'm five kilometers over. Yeah, but that five kilometers over means that you're not going to be able to stop within the distance if a big truck pulls out in front of you or if a child pulls out in front of you or a, a vehicle drops a load and you're traveling at an excess speed. So uh, vehicles today are designed in such a way that they give you a false sense of security with the ABS system in them and the airbags and the seat belts and you know how the road's been deadened. Uh, you really don't notice the speeds and in the higher end vehicles you can actually be doing 130, 140 kilometers an hour and not realize you're traveling that fast. And when you watch the commercials for the vehicles, how often does it look like they're really doing a safe speed? It's cool to go fast. Well, it, it's interesting that you mention that because people have a false concept of what is safe driving. Every car commercial out there right now has a disclaimer on it that says professional driver, closed circuit, do not attempt mm -hmm. at home. Even minivans, you know, soccer moms' minivans are being promoted on the concept that these things can go fast and stop fast and do all sorts of miraculous things. Speed by itself is dangerous, but speed combined with fatigue, combined with cell phone use, combined with other distractions, combined with substance abuse is the combination that gives us the problem. And so speed is the one thing that we can go after immediately because the rules are out there. The engineers told us they think 110 is the safest speed on this roadway, which is interesting because in Ontario, that road would have a speed of 100 kilometers an hour. But it's also interesting that Ontario has a lot lower injury statistics than Alberta does. And in the states, for example, we know that states that took away the speed limit and allowed whatever speed you wanted to do, saw a similar increase in fatalities and injuries as well. I'm just wondering if you know the statistics on the Autobahn. In Germany, you say that the U.S. show that there were more injuries where they didn't have posted speed limits. How about in Germany? When you take a look at the Autobahn, the problems that they have with collisions on it are quite high. And they've actually had to station six major helicopter bases that follow the Autobahn. Because when they do have collisions, the majority of them are actually fatalities. Um, there were some statistics released a few days ago regarding Alberta having the lowest uh, mean, a mean age across Canada uh, and also an abundance of males. Do you think that those statistics mixed with the fact that we've got this robust oil and gas sector and abundance of sports cars as a result of it feed into this notion of the speed being a problem? Actually, a lot of the international uh, petrochemical companies that work around the world, when they compare their international statistics for injuries and they compare Alberta to, let's say, Norway or Alaska or any other place, Saudi Arabia, where they're doing similar work under similar extreme conditions of either heat or cold, they find that Alberta, for some reason or other, their injury rates are far higher than any other place. And coming back to your point about Alberta, yes, you know, there's a lot of disposable income, yes, there's a lot of young males, and yes, there's a lot of cell phone use, and yes, there's a lot of fatigue and substance abuse as well. And it's when you combine all those different elements together in an industry that expects everything to be done yesterday that we see what we're seeing today.
So every person I talk to talks about how quickly time seems to be moving, how much more they have to do in a day. They have work and family, raising kids, soccer practices, deadlines. I think it's no surprise that we find ourselves driving when we're a little bit uh, more tired than we should be while driving. Tell me a bit about fatigue. Well, we all have a clock in us. It's our, our, our clock that sets our sleep mechanism, basically. And it's like a bank. And if you get sleep deprived, then you have to replenish that account. And the only way to replenish it is to go to sleep. So if you're driving and you actually have one of those moments where you shake your head, you've been out for about three seconds. What you need to do is basically stop the vehicle and go to sleep, even if it's for only 20 minutes, to recharge your battery so that you can continue the trip to get to a place that's safe to do. And uh, part of the reason that we're seeing so many collisions lately uh, we believe is directly related to people falling asleep at the wheel and uh, being involved in collisions. That's the only way to explain the majority of these single vehicle collisions, unless they're suicides, then there are people falling asleep at the wheel and everybody is doing it. What about the myth that uh, I'm just going to stop for a cup of joe, I'm going to pull into the Tims and you know give me a double-double? Well, you know, caffeine's a stimulant, so what might happen is that you'll get a little burst. But uh, if you're sleep deprived, then the only thing that's going to replenish that uh, is sleep. Unless you're taking, you know, narcotics, amphetamines, and other things that you shouldn't be taking. But uh, sleep deprivation is only corrected with sleep. And the times that it's worst are when it's at night and it's dark and your body's telling you you should be sleeping, or usually in the afternoon between two and four, when everyone's circadian rhythm's at its lowest, when people do need sleep around that time, if they're sleep deprived. So it's a major problem, but nobody talks about it. Well, let's actually go to the audience and find if there are any questions or comments about uh, fatigue. And I can imagine that everyone's experienced it at some time. Does anyone have any comments or questions about it? Dr. Liu, how does fatigue affect reaction time? Good question. At the best of times, it takes 1.6 seconds. 1.6 seconds to see, decide, and react. Okay, so the see, decide, react cycle, when something happens, takes 1.6 seconds if you're fully awake and fully alert. So you can imagine if you're traveling, you know, even at the top speed limit of 110 kilometers an hour, 1.6 seconds means you've traveled a great distance. And so if you're happening on a road that has a curve and you're fatigued and a deer comes out or a moose comes out, very realistic situations for workers out in the, in the field, anything that reduces your reaction time will increase the likelihood that you'll be involved in a collision. So if you're speeding, if you're fatigued, uh, and the situation presents itself, then fatigue can reduce your reaction time by obviously up to 100%, but incrementally depending on how tired you are. Dr. Liu, I'm a supervisor and I have several people who work for me that their job is to drive throughout our business unit and check on crews and they're in the construction. We promote pulling over and having a nap if you're tired. But it's very progressive as a supervisor to tell people, listen, if you're exhausted, for heaven's sakes, pull over, it's okay. The company believes that safety is the number one priority and if you're too tired to drive, pull over and get the nap that you need, it's okay. I want to talk a little bit about uh, people that, and there are a number of people here that drive for a living or drive in the field or supervise people that drive in the field. And I just have a question about uh, using, uh, I think they're called like wake ups, or you know those little things you can take when you're just a little bit tired. Is that going to impair you? Is that going to, are you going to be safe driving a motor vehicle if you're doing those little pick me ups that are, that are illegal? Yeah, I don't know enough about them, but uh, if, if you're at the stage where you need a pick me up, you're really at the stage where you need sleep. So it comes right back to don't look to solve a problem with another drug. Look to solve a problem with what nature's telling you you need, which is sleep, which is free and has no side effects. So we've talked about a number of factors that impact our ability to drive safely. What other factors are there that we maybe haven't touched on today? 
There's a few things you should do while you're driving. First is empty your bladder before you get into the vehicle because if you don't, chances are good if you've worn your seatbelt properly, you're going to rupture your bladder. The other one is nothing on the steering wheel because there's another airbag there. Don't even drive with your hands crossed because when the airbag goes off, those hands will come back and hit you. Definitely don't drive with a pen writing on your steering wheel because if the airbag goes off, the pen will go right into your head. Never drive with your feet on the dash in the passenger side because that's where the airbag is. And it's usually young females that do this. They're driving and they got their feet hanging on the front dash. If you were involved in a collision, an airbag would meet your feet at about 260 kilometers an hour and those knees would meet your face at the exact same speed. And so what would end up happening is you would dislocate your hips and you would get your knees right in your face as well. And the last thing is remember that it takes about 15 to 20 seconds to properly adjust your seat belt when you get in your vehicle. Most people don't realize that. Dr. Liu, can you expand on the, the way to properly put your seat belt on? Well, it takes about 15 to 20 seconds to put a seat belt on properly. First of all, you have to make sure the seat's right. So as you sit in your seat, uh, you have to make sure that, you know, because your clothes change and during the day you, your height changes and stuff like that. So what you have to do is sit down, make sure the mirrors are okay, your vision's all okay. If that's all set, then you take your seatbelt and your seatbelt's got to come snugly over the collarbone, okay? And then it's got to come over both pelvic bones, you know those big hip bones? The seatbelt's got to rest right on those hip bones. And then once it's clicked in, then you really got to cinch it up and make it nice and tight. So when your seatbelt's on properly, it's slightly uncomfortable. Most people just get in their vehicle, put on their seatbelt and drive away. If you're in a crash and you don't have seatbelt retentioners, those are little cartridges that explode and actually suck you back in your seat, you can still hit the windshield. So you can still hit the windshield with a seatbelt on if you didn't put it on properly. Or you'll meet the airbag at a, at a far greater speed. Because you're traveling 100, the airbag's coming out at 260. That's 100 kilometers this way, 260 kilometers this way, and then you're going to hit it head on. As opposed to if you had a seat belt that's on nice and tight with your head restraint properly adjusted, then you'll minimize the impact. If, may you fracture your pelvis and your chest? Yes, you can get those injuries. If you get those injuries, chances are you would have been dead without the seat belt. We see people come in with fractured collarbones and pelvic injuries, but they would have been dead if they hadn't had the seatbelt. So the seatbelt still saved their lives. And in the winter, it's even worse when you got winter clothes on. And it's worse for your kids when they're all bulked up and you, you know, put them in different kinds of clothes. Seatbelt adjusting for kids is very difficult at the best of times. For me, a crying baby is quite distracting. So a lot of times when I'm driving, I'm passing him the soother in the back or I'm switching the CD music or passing him a toy. I have a little pile of toys beside me. So um, See, that's where you made the mistake. You're not a babysitter. You're a driver of a vehicle. And when you drive the vehicle, you're the captain of the vehicle. And your prime responsibility is driving the vehicle. And that's just a distractor, just like all the other distractors we talked about. If a baby cries, a baby cries. Let the baby cry. Eventually, they'll stop crying. We sort of alluded to the fact that the best way to change behavior is targeting behavior. And we've got a number of people in the audience today who are 13, 14, 15. Some have their learner's licenses. Some don't. Um, I'm just wondering if, you know, how do, how do kids learn to drive? Well, we, we have to understand that uh, there's going to be a whole new generation of drivers coming out there. And so we've got to make it as easy for these new drivers to feel as safe as possible. The most important one is, as new drivers are starting to learn how to drive, you should limit the number of other teenagers that are going to be in the vehicle at any one given time. So for the first six to eight months, there should only be maybe one other teenager who's responsible enough, hopefully a family member, unless there's an adult present in the vehicle. Uh, obviously, no alcohol or drugs. You should restrict the hours that these young people are able to drive as they're learning. Uh, the worst time is weekends, and the worst time is between 12 and 5 in the morning. So let's say a 12 to 6 curfew would be rather appropriate. Doing those simple things right there, and no cell phone use, will drastically reduce the incidence of injuries in that population. I know of a number of our operation folks, uh, they have to carry a lot of equipment and such in, in, uh, to do their jobs and a lot of times it's sometimes it's not secured in the back. What kind of uh, injuries can you sustain from, from not having things secured in the cab when you have an incident? Well, I, I know of one patient who 
had gone to do some shopping around Thanksgiving and had a frozen turkey and put it in the back seat, was involved in a collision, and the frozen turkey flew in the vehicle, struck her head, and she has a permanent brain injury. This woman will never be the same again because of a frozen turkey that was left on the back seat. So if a frozen turkey can do that, you can imagine what some of this equipment that uh, field personnel are using that's not secured. Uh, what they should do is, before they start their trip, is look at anything that's in the vehicle and ask themselves, would I like that to hit my head at 100 kilometers an hour? Because whatever's in the vehicle is traveling the same speed that the vehicle is. And if you come to a sudden stop for whatever reason, that thing is going to fly within the vehicle. And if it hits your head, would you like that toolkit to hit your head or would you like that valve stem to hit your head? If you wouldn't, then either don't have it in there or secure it so that uh, it's properly restrained in the event of uh, an unforeseen collision. I was just curious about the stats. I'm not familiar with them. How many people in North America are being injured or killed every day in a collision? Well, in the United States every year, there's about 42,000 people that die as a result of motor vehicle collisions. In Alberta every year, there's about, uh, it varies, 420 to 450, depending on the year, people die as a result of motor vehicle collisions. But you have to remember that as our emergency medical systems have become better and more sophisticated, a lot of people are not dying that have permanent disabling injuries, especially the brain injuries. In the old days, these people would have died, but because we have paramedics and helicopters and intensive care units and trauma units, we're saving a lot more people. So there's a lot more people that are being saved with far more serious injuries than we've seen in the past. But the problem in Canada costs us about $25 billion a year. Billion, not million. $25 billion a year is directly related to motor vehicle related collisions. So it's a major, major, major problem. It's actually such a big problem that I think we've become desensitized to it because every leading newscast talks about the car crash. Front page of every paper has these pictures and the radio is always telling us about them. So we expect them. So the fact that they happen, we go, well, they happen every day. They're talking about them every day. Every long weekend, we lose 10 or 15 people. What's the news? So the fact that there's no news about this is really the news, but unfortunately, the media is missing it. We should be asking our politicians, what the heck is going on here? Why do we allow this to continue when it doesn't have to happen? I worked in emergency yesterday, and I can tell you, there was no shortage of broken bones and you know, battered skulls as a result of motor vehicle collisions in all age groups. So Dr. Liu, um, some people who might be watching this, uh, this video production might think that your views are extreme. Um, and people here might be thinking, well, you know, I might make some of those changes, but not all of them. Dr. Liu's pretty extreme. How, how would you respond to that? Well, it's not extreme. I mean, as the recipient of all these people that end up going to our emergency department, I can tell you there's, there's nothing more frustrating than having to walk from the trauma room to the family room and tell a family that their loved one that was perfectly fine an hour ago is now either dead or seriously disfigured or seriously disabled. I mean, most of the time when these patients are able to talk to us, they tell us, you know, I never thought this could happen to me. So what, what the audience should understand very clearly is this happens to real people and this could happen to you as you're driving home today. And uh, it's not uh, beyond me to sort of try and convey the message of how powerful this hurt is and, and the pain and suffering that people are going through when it, they don't have to go through it. Other diseases, you know, slowly creep up on you. Injury doesn't. You know, you go from being perfectly healthy to either dead or seriously disabled within a fraction of a second. And it puts people in a world that they're not used to. But this is the world that my colleagues and I are in and what we're trying to do is say, listen, you don't want to cross that line and come see what we do because it's pretty brutal. And uh, it happens when you least expect it. So the next trip you're in your vehicle, that is probably the trip where something's going to happen because you don't expect it. You don't think it's going to happen to you. But it happens to hundreds of thousands of people every year in this country. If this many people died from tainted water or from meningitis or from mad cow disease, you can rest assured that we would be doing something about it. But because it's just a simple old stupid car crash, we've accepted it, unless it happens to you. 
in which case you driving down from Edmonton today there was no shortage of memorials on the side of the road so you put your flowers and grief and a little cross on the side of the road and uh, you know that's that's the best we can come up with as a society that's unacceptable that's totally unacceptable so a lot of great information today and I think you know people have people have to make the right choices we can make the right choices if you don't make them you'll be visiting me in the emergency room all right, thanks so much for coming today and thanks so much for the great questions. Appreciate it. The biggest takeaway message for me from today was, um, was cell phones and driving. I don't think I've ever had a conversation in a car that was worth dying for. What I took away from this thing was uh, that Bluetooth can't really help you even though in your mind you think it's safer than if you just have your, uh, your cell phone in your hand. We all have a sphere of influence and for me the, the biggest impact I can have is starting with my kids. We can make or break drivers uh, one at a time and as we raise our children so that's a key one for me. Be hypocritical of me to, to, to tell them to do certain things or not do certain things if I'm doing it myself. Even though we have no control over what other people are doing, we better start take, uh, taking control of what we do.